Hey, Tom, I, I feel bad about all the jokes that I've been making. Um, I didn't mean to rib you. <laughs> and that I thought the dad me. jokes were the end of the episode, not the beginning. Oh, they are woven into the tapestry of this podcast, my friend. Uh, that's actually they the theme. Sprinkled, they're sprinkled on the top like a good barbecue rub. Exactly. So that's actually the theme of our podcast today. We're going to talk about smoking ribs. But uh, just like every other podcast that we do, uh, what you drinking, Tom, first? So today I'm drinking, actually, a couple of weeks ago, you you mentioned on this uh, Hibiki, the Japanese scotch. So I said, I'm going to pull that out because you actually gave me a bottle of this uh, of this uh, a while ago, probably. I can't, I can't even remember, maybe 10 years ago. More so I'm that. drinking a Hibiki 17, 17-year-old 17 Japanese uh, whiskey. Not a scotch, but a whiskey. So that actually means it's 27 years old. <laughs> So, yeah, so. <laughs> that's true, <laughs> but it doesn't. Once it's in the bottle, it doesn't age anymore. So you're you're, you're not picking up any changing, and ch I don't think at least any changes. So you might you might differ with that. So interestingly, I want to talk about the hibiki. It's called. I, did yeah, I pronounce that right. But yeah. uh, interestingly, maybe I've mentioned this before, but when you distill alcohol, you actually change the alcohol on a molecular level, and the best okay. way I've heard it described is like the molecules get spiky. So when you drink... You freshly, mentioned that before. Yeah. So when you drink freshly distilled alcohol, it has this weird burn. And that's not just the alcohol content, because you can have high alcohol content, but you, you know, it, it's, it's a matter of the molecules being different. So okay. even if you just left it, and it has to be at about 120 proof to get the ideal amount, if you just left it in the bottle, the spikiness goes down over time. Just through the molecules change? Yeah, it's kind of like they chill out. They're like, oh, yeah, all right, we're not angry anymore, and they kind of chill out. The barrel helps it along, and the oak, and the tannins, and the caramelized um, sugars in the wood, and all that stuff. Interesting. But after 17 years, I don't think there's any spiky molecules in it. But if you got a younger, if you got a younger kind of like bourbon that was like three years old. And you just let even in glass. Even in glass, the, okay. it's going gonna, it's gonna to do its thing a little bit. It's not going to be major changes. Most of those molecules calm down in the first year or so. Okay. So, or even less. So, very there cool. You go. Huh. So, is it yeah. is it good? Is it peaty? Is it what is it? It's not peaty. No peat at all. Um, it's got a little. It's a little bit of a harsh taste, like a bite uh, or mm -hmm. a burn, which norm, which I, you know, don't normally find in in uh, scotch, um, or at least the ones that I drink. It's got a very nice smell, almost a fruity uh, hmm. aroma, but um, I I don't I'm not a huge fan of its uh, of its taste. But it's whiskey, and I'll drink it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It, it's um, it, it people seem to like it, but I remember you gave me a taste, and I didn't. I noticed that too. It was a little bit of a burn that you're not used yeah. to in that yeah. type of whiskey. It's all. It almost tasted like. Like a like I had a bourbon taste to it. Like when you have a lot of corn, bourbon has a ton of corn in it. It and tastes we, corny. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> there's another <laughs> corny joke. <laughs> Boy, there what, are you, you go. what are you drinking? So I am actually drinking the national uh, beverage of Turkey. Oh, so, you told me you were going to get a bottle of this. Yep. So interesting. It's fact Turkey that, Yay, right? I think they changed the name of the country. Uh, well, is it? Yeah, they just so, changed the name of the country. I did not realize that. I was just going to give you a factoid. Okay, it, tell me. <laughs> you probably already know this, obviously, but um, Turkey is actually the Ottoman Empire. Yeah. So a lot of people are like, oh, the Ottoman Empire disappeared. I'm like, no, they just changed their name. They're kind of like, and even then they were kind of known as the Turks. And, yeah. and it was actually named after one prince who was one of their great conquerors. But nobody really talks about the Ottoman Empire. They ruled a huge chunk of yeah, the world for 600, 600 years. Yeah. Um, Plus they, the gateway between Asia and Europe is, you know, Constantinople in that area. You know. And even now, there's still relatively a decent-sized world power and economy. Yeah. Uh, and it's just kind of like everybody's like, oh, Turkey, where's that? But you name Russia or, you know, the U.S. Yeah. or something, people are always going to know. But Turkey's out there, man. But, and this is the it begins with an R, right? So this is Yeni Rocky. Rocky. So okay. Y E N I R A K I. Yeah. So I don't know if I like it yet. They say that it is by far the most popular alcoholic beverage, but you you make what is called lion's milk out of it. Okay. 
I've so heard you, this, but I, I can't remember what's in it. So you just take a, a dash of the Yeni Rocky, pour it in a glass, and there's no particular amount. It's just, they say, quote unquote, to taste. Okay. So you do that, and it's clear, and it smells a lot like uh, Sambuca. Okay. Oh, like a licorice almost? Yep, because they use anise in it, which uh, mm. every time I, la- I say I giggle a little bit. But uh, they use they use a niece in it. <laughs> but um, they they you put that in, and when you put water in it, it turns white. Oh, so it's really? It looks just like vodka, and then you put water in it, it turns white. So I looked it up online, and for lack of a better explanation, basically it's an emulsification thing that happens. Oh, okay, the oils and stuff that are in it kind of half mix with the water, but not fully. So that's why they call it lion's milk because it, it's white. Interesting. It's almost it's like semi opaque depending on the size of your glass. Okay, and how much water do you put in it? Uh, you, no, no particular amount, just to taste. Okay. Uh, hmm. So I I tried it with uh, a couple of different amounts. Like I did it first of all, I tried it straight, and it it tastes like sambuca if you took out all of the sugar. Okay. So it's a little intense. Uh, but it's and it smells when you have the lion's milk made. It smells just like a black jelly bean. Interesting, huh? But then Can you drink you, it. Could you accomplish the same thing with an ice cube? Like, would it cloud it as it gets as it melts? Yep, exactly the same thing. Neat. So tonight, actually, I got the best amount. I did almost fifty fifty, okay. just eyeballing it. And that seems to taste the best. Like that's the most enjoyable. Sometimes it's too watery. Sometimes it's too strong. About 50-50 was best, but Yeni Rocky, I really just wanted to, I saw it on a travel show, uh, and I wanted to and try wanted it. And you wanted to try it. And it's worth And you it. found it in a local liquor store? It wasn't something you had to search for? No, so if I want something specific, I'll usually buy it online. So wine.com. Oh, okay. Yeah, wine.com, uh, we, I use wine.com. Yeah, yeah. and we're, they don't, we're not part of the show or affiliated or anything with that. It's just, it's easy. So yeah. if I know what I want, I go there. But if I don't know what I want, I want to try something new, I walk into a place, and I'll usually just start awkwardly talking to people, either people that work there or not, and say, hey, you know anything good? Yeah. You'd be surprised. The, cap- the, the area where we live, Capital District of New York, has some huge liquor stores like warehouses, and um, there's two that are you know pretty pretty good size, maybe even three, one uh, not quite as big. But the, they have just – an enormous selection of even obscure things, which is, which is cool. But I, um, for gifting, wine.com is awesome because they, yeah. you know, they have everything and they get it to you in a day or two or get it to your, you know, who you're sending it to. Yeah, it is really convenient, wine.com. Uh, I am all about the small liquor stores or going someplace, though. Yeah. Because, you know, you'd be surprised if somebody came up to you and said, hey, I'm not much of a whiskey drinker. Do you have anything to recommend? I imagine you would be like, let me show you. I really yeah, like this or that. I'll help people if I if they talk to me. Yeah. Yeah. So I do the same thing. If I'm in a section and I'm like, man, I've never had this before. I'll find a guy standing next to me. You ever have that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I drank that, you know, with my cousin last year and it was, wasn't bad. Very peaty. Yeah. Like, oh, cool. Perfect. You know. Yeah. I'm going to have to try that, uh, Recky. That's a good That's a good idea. So today we're going to talk about something that is near and dear to your heart uh, because yes. it is your specialty. And I was thinking about you today because I didn't smoke ribs. I actually smoked a pork butt, which ironically is not part of the pig's butt. It's the butt of the shoulder. <laughs> and uh, it, came, it came out good. I How did it turn out? Good. Bone in. Uh, Bone in. Little, okay. I did it on the pit barrel. I did it so the I used the rack. I didn't hang it this time because it didn't have the meshing because it came from a local butcher. We bought the pig and he butchered it, so there was no wrapping or anything to hold it together. If uh, you don't have it, it'll, it'll fall apart. But I was thinking about you. I'm like, man, if Tom were here, he'd uh, he'd be definitely doing ribs. <laughs> doesn't I, matter. I, it doesn't matter. What, do he'd ribs. just be doing ribs. <laughs> yeah, I've I've kind of settled into, uh, you know, I I really have limited my um, barbecuing to or my smoking to, to ribs. Although I do do some boneless chicken breasts, skinless boneless chicken breasts that turn out. Pretty good, I think we're happy. In fact, we're going to be doing that tomorrow night. We're having some guests stay with us. Oh, nice. So, uh, who don't eat pork? Otherwise, I would be doing ribs. <laughs> so, who doesn't eat pork? I know he <laughs> said he says he doesn't eat pork, so he said, "Ah, uh, that knocks the ribs off the off the table." <laughs> He's just hasn't. He's had missing your ribs. out. 
Yeah. Yeah, and we we have a friend uh, who's also, you know, a, a, a barbecue fanatic, and and uh, I've been gloating over my ribs and how they turn out, sending him pictures of them, but he's on a diet right now where he can't eat any red meat. So he, we had meat. him over. It counts as red. It, 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 to him, it counts as red meat. Pork counts as red meat. He's only on chicken, turkey, that type of stuff. Oh. Fish. That sounds terrible. So, yeah, it is. So I made, he, he was over uh, last week for a little cookout we did. And uh, I had a big tray of ribs there. And <laughs> <laughs> Good friend. Good friend, Tom. <laughs> That's the type of friend I am. Always yeah. thinking of the other person. <laughs> So I have to say though, your ribs uh, look like they come out of a magazine, and you have a very specific process that I, I'm pretty sure you've done a couple hundred racks of ribs or more. So I'd like to know. That's what we want to talk about tonight. What is the process that works so well for you to get the same good ribs each time? Because that's my problem is consistency. One time yeah. I'll be like, these are amazing. And the next time I'm like, whoa, are these just like garbage with bones in it? I don't understand. Yeah, so, I, that that's exactly it. And I, the key word is consistency, at least in, you know, from my experience. So, and that's why I had such a problem with the, with the Piperol smoker, because, um, you know, and if you, if anybody who's listening has, is wondering why I'm saying that we, we did an episode on, you know, our, our feelings about the pit barrel smoker. And that's why I had such a problem with it because I couldn't get the consistent result that I wanted to. And, and um, w where th with my technique for doing ribs is like I have a very specific set of instructions. And it's um, over a certain amount of time. And for this amount of time, you do this. And for this amount of time, you do that. And then you change the temperature. And you want to hold it really, you know, right exactly where you want it. And in order to do that, or uh, at least the way I think is that that pellet smoker does it perfect because you dial in the temperature and and it keeps the the uh, smoker right at that temperature so it, it accomplishes what i'm trying to do you know you know i <laughs> so many jokes are about the using a pellet smoker are running through my head but oh, I i've already it. i've already made the low-rise jeans joke and the man bun uh, i don't know i know i know you have but <laughs> when you when you eat my ribs <laughs> you'll take all those jokes back all right, so let's get into the nitty gritty here. So I, I use what's called the three two one method. Yeah, so that's common. Here, here's I'll, I'll tell you my method so everybody can hear it. Um, you should never use just timing, in my opinion. You should use temperature mm -hmm. because the ideal temperature of ribs, in my opinion, I've had the best results at one ninety five. I take it off at one ninety five, and I let the ribs rest for a minimum of fifteen minutes. So the reason you let the ribs rest is all the fat that has come out that has rendered, uh, whatever is left, if you cut it open too soon, all the juice runs out. And everybody's like, oh, look at all the juice. That juice was the moisture that just left your meat. It was all the fat and the flavor. The 15 to 30 minutes, depending on what you're smoking, of letting it rest, allows your meat to soak it back up. And it coagulates just enough to hang on to the meat. Okay. So it gives you a nice juicy rib. But three three hours straight smoke, about anywhere from 190 to 250 degrees in my pit barrel. I hang it. Okay. I'll spray it maybe once or twice at most, sometimes not. I'll take it off, and I'll wrap it, and I've started wrapping butcher paper, which works mm -hmm. better. And I find sliced pineapple works the best for me. Oh, okay. All right. Little, little you trick. The acid and the sweet. Yep. Acid and the sweet and the pineapple fruit itself. Just laying it on there. You don't have to pour all this juice in there because it naturally juices itself as it goes. Okay. So, and then after two hours of that, so three hours smoker, two hours um, wrapped, and you can either do that on the smoker or in the oven, then it's one hour left, and that gets hung back in the smoker. Okay. And then 30 minutes before I take it out, so halfway through that last hour, I wipe it down with barbecue sauce to get a little bit of caramelized barbecue sauce on the outside. And then by then, I'm usually 195 exactly, which is when connective tissue starts to break down. I don't like to go over 200 because then what happens is uh, you get mushy ribs. Yeah, true. Uh, yep. So I like 195 with a little bit of chew on it. Then I wrap it again. Let it sit there for 15 to 30 minutes and then enjoy. That's okay. my method. But sometimes ribs go a little bit quicker, unfortunately. And now I'm rushing yeah. to get barbecue sauce on. 
sometimes they take a little bit longer and a six and a half hour, seven. And I'm like, Oh man, I'm getting hungry. And you know, family's like, where's the ribs? So that's my what, what do you do? What type of ribs do you buy? So I don't like the extra meaty ones. Okay. Um, they, they sell those at a lot of stores now, the extra meaty ribs. It just tastes like a pork chop to me. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll usually buy the, um, baby back, uh, sometimes a St. Louis style, the different types of ribs that you get, you're going to actually have to cook a little bit less or a little bit more depending on the okay. size of the yeah. rib. But so three, two, one though works on most racks of ribs. How about, how about you though? So I go with a full set of spare ribs, which is the, you know, the, the baby back ribs plus the additional little um, yeah. section on knuckle that's on the top. And I, like I do some some trimming of them beforehand. So I trim off any little hanging pieces. Um, there's a flap of meat that's on the back side of the rib. I trim that off. Oh, and you I do. also Yep. And I also it it seems wasteful. You know, the first couple times you do it, you're like, oh, I shouldn't be throwing this away. Cause it's a decent it's probably you know, by the time you're done with, with a full set of ribs, two racks, you're probably throwing away a pound of, of meat. Really? Um, Why yeah. don't you cook it and eat it? You could do that. But, we're, you know, you're, usually there's so much ribs, so it's not something we use. Sometimes my wife will take it and use it to make sauce. Hmm. Um, she likes to put it in sauce. Um, then I'll clean up any little hanging bits around to kind of square them up a little bit. Um, and then I pull off the the silver skin, the fleshy or the, the piece of um, a membrane that's on the back of the rib. So let me ask you, I want to, because your ribs are way better than mine. I want to ask you, I never pull that off because when I have pulled that off in the past, sometimes the ribs fall apart when I hang them. Yeah. So you see, I'm not hanging, I'm laying, I'm laying the ribs. So I understand. Yeah. That is a, that would be a problem if you're hanging. Um, you know, you have to make sure to hang, several ribs in i would think you know so you get really a solid rib you don't want to mm -hmm. hang you know at the left and depending on the how how far they're hanging too you don't want the the bottom of it to be right on top of the fire either in the pit barrel so um but in my case i've i've done it both ways i started off pulling it off then i switched to scoring it so some some people recommend instead of pulling it off you can just cross hatch it with a really sharp knife and that accomplishes the same thing but honestly i, d I don't like it i like to have it gone so when, when I'm eating it, it and I've scored it, it, it just is off-putting to me. It's like um, getting a little bit of wrapper in your yeah. food. It's just yeah. unpleasant. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm, I've gotten pretty good at taking it off. You, could, you know, the way that I do it is I take a butter knife, and I, uh, at the edge of the rib, I just slide the butter knife along one of the rib bones underneath it, and then I use my fingers right on top of the butter knife and kind of just expand it, and that allows it to to pull off in that area. And then if you have a paper towel, you can just grab it with the paper towel and, and get it off. So I try to get, I try hmm. to do a good job of getting that off. Um, do you get it I off in, do you get it off in one piece? It, some, most of the time, the majority of it will come off, maybe like 70% of it. And then I have to clean the rest of it up just by playing with it. Okay. What do you do for seasoning? Do you season before you, before you smoke? Yeah, I'll usually do a rub. My th whole thing though is, uh, a good rub is important, but by the time you're done with ribs, it, the barbecue sauce is more important than the rub. Agreed. Yeah. So I I use um I'll use something called white lightning, which is basically just salt and pepper with some other basic seasonings in there, and and it, that's really all you want is salt and pepper in a lot of ways. Yeah. But just something basic. You don't want something that'll take over the flavor because otherwise it'll fight with the barbecue sauce likely later on. Yeah. Yeah. So. It, I've again, like you know, I've done a lot of ribs, and I've and I've tried lots of different barbecue uh, rubs. Um, I w had settled on for a little while Meat Church's uh, rubs because they they make some pretty good stuff. Um, they have like a honey a honey one that's uh, that is actually pretty good, and we've used when we're doing um, some other types of of uh, barbecuing. But I'm right now I'm just doing salt and pepper. So I salt and pepper it about an hour before I put it on the grill and, or on the smoker. And then I do the same thing at the end of it, at the end of my process. The, for the last 30 minutes, I barbecue sauce and let it caramel a little bit. Yeah, I think that's the best uh, best way to do it. What, do you, uh, you what, barbecue, to... what barbecue sauce you use, are you using? So don't laugh, but I like my barbecue sauce like I like my liquor, lowbrow. 
I'm using Sweet Baby Ray's. Sweet Baby Ray's. That's what I use. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's something about it. You know, it has a high sugar content. It goes on easy. And for some reason, it just, when I've used other barbecue sauces, like really expensive ones, my family and friends are kind of like, uh, oh, yeah, these are good. When I use Sweet Baby Ray's, they're like, oh, my goodness. Yeah. Sweet Smack Baby that Ray's. rack is... of ribs. It's like... <laughs> Slap your mama ribs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It um it, it I don't know why, but it just it always is a fan favorite. It yeah. it works. Yeah. So my my process, I started off with the three two one method and I did that for quite a while actually. And I and I was happy with the results, but I but I um I wanted to tweak it and get it like to be competition you know, quality. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I spent a lot of time, um, you know, and it's not my originality. Like I found some, some really good resources. Like YouTube is just awesome for that. It, uh, you can, if you find somebody that you, you, you know, you like, they, um, they oftentimes ha share really good tips with you. And I found this one guy called the mad scientist barbecue and he's a, a smoking fiend. He, he has all kinds of smokers and he, he um, does a, you know, a podcast, or I don't know if he does a podcast, but he does, you know, relatively regular episodes that talk about smoking different things. And so he did a, um, a an episode where he talked about the three, two, one method and, you know, what he thought was good about it and what he thought could be changed. And so I followed his process, which is um, also five hours. So, it, uh, um, or a little over five hours, I think maybe five and a half. So three, two, one, six, this is five and a half. You start off for the first hour and a half at, um, two twenty five, mm -hmm. And, um, that you basically for the first hour and a half, you just put the ribs in at high smoke, as much smoke as you can produce at two twenty five. after an hour and a half. Then I start spraying it every 20 minutes with, um, a mixture. I started off my spray mixture being 50 vinegar, 50 apple juice. And now I've been doing, um, one third vinegar, one third apple juice and one third bourbon. Mm. Oh, wow. And, yeah. And so at an hour and a half, still temperatures at 225. Um, then every 20 minutes I spray it, I wet it down, um, which helps, you know, preserve the moisture content because the evaporation is not coming out of the meat. So you're keeping the meat really moist. So then for the next hour, you've sprayed it three times. Then once I hit two and a half hours, uh, then I start spraying it every 15 minutes and I raise the temperature to 275. Um, and then, then so for the next hour at 275, I'm spraying every 15 minutes. And every time you come back to spray, the meat has dried, has, you know, the surface has dried again. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you've got this really incredible bark that develops as a result of that, all that, uh, all that attention. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I'm during the time I'm, I'm monitoring my smoke level. I, you know, my smoker, as I've talked about, has this little extra smoke box. So I, I'm constantly adding chunk wood to that to keep the smoke content as high as possible at the, at, after that, after two and a half hours or three, after three and a half hours. Now it's still at two seventy five. Now I wrap it in butcher paper and drizzle on top of it um, some some um, beef ta um, Wagyu tallow. So I take mm -hmm. about two tablespoons of Wagyu tallow, put them in a little um, little uh, uh, disposable pan inside my smoker and from the beginning. So they it's been melted and smoked, actually. And um, drizzle that over the top of them, wrap them in the butcher paper, and put them back in for another hour, at two, is keeping it at 275. And then at the end of that, I take them out and I uh, slather them with barbecue sauce and put them back in for the last thirty minutes at at two seventy five, and they are they are pretty good. So that sounds really really labor intensive, though. It is. I you can, it's not set and forget. You have okay. to you have to sit by the grill by the smoke. See, I, I was just bragging about the fact that uh, the other day I'm like, oh yeah, I I spray my ribs once every hour or so. <laughs> so no, you're you're out there every 15 minutes. Every 15 you're, minutes, you're gonna get wetted with the best bourbon around. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't check the temperature either. Like I don't I don't test the temperature. I've done it so many times. I'm just relying on the fact that as long as my grill is at the uh, my smoker is at the temperature I want, I'm gonna get mm. the the result that I want, and it works. So. So interestingly, I, I 
I've talked about this show. There's a show on Netflix that they have a barbecue competition. I watch them check the temperature constantly. And matter of fact, that show makes me feel better because you have these professional uh, barbecue chefs, and they're all like, "Oh, it's stalling," and yeah. they're freaking out like I do. And they're, they're but they're always checking the temperature, and they they all say the temperature. But obviously, there's something to be said if you do the same thing so often, you have such a controlled environment that it's going to come out the way you want it each time. And that's what I'm relying on. Yeah. Does, like if, if I know my smoker temperature is 225 and it's going to result in my, and, and, you know, at a certain time I change it to 275, the only thing that's going to, that could potentially change is maybe the ribs are bigger than, than they normally would be. And it might take longer for them to get to a certain temperature. But I, I buy typically the same size package of ribs every time. Okay. Man, you really did go for consistency. That's consistency, yep. But it's, no it's a, but it's a half an hour shorter, right? You said it's... Yeah, uh, five and a half hours it, it ends up being. All right, the three, two, one method is six hours. Six hours, yeah. Yep. Um, I, wonder, I wonder how that works out, though. So the three, two, one method, you're getting a lot of bark, but you're getting... You're getting um, not as much flavor because you're not spraying oh. it as much. You, you, the three, two, one method. You mean? Yeah, and if yeah. you're hanging hanging the ribs like me, I imagine like if you're spraying with bourbon and apple juice and apple cider vinegar, third, a third, a third. If you're laying the ribs down, I imagine that's an advantage because now the ribs are getting that and is staying on it. Whereas it's if I sitting hang on it, it, yeah. And I if I hang it and spray it, it just kind of runs off. Yeah, quicker. no, it's it's like I'm I'm actually I'm spraying it enough to wet the surface, so it's not just a mist. Like I'm actually I'm wetting the surface, so it's like visibly wet and and even maybe a little bit of pool, you know, small pooling on on the top of it. But by the time I come back, it's gone. So and there, flip- I was actually watching an article about or reading an article about people who use water baths in their in their smoker. Mm-hmm. Because they're trying to increase the, the you know the moisture content of the smoker, but I I don't I don't feel the need to do that. So I've actually heard a couple of guys talk about that. Um, I've watched professionals use it, but others have said that you're creating steam, and if you're doing it right, you don't need that. You, you don't want water steam. Yeah, you're just steaming your meat. It's not it's not what you want. Yeah, spraying it with a mixture and adding flavor that's what you want. Yeah. Have you ever and injected your ribs? No, I've never done in, injections. Um, have you ever tried that? No, but I want to. I, okay. I watched them do that on a recent video that I was watching. Did they inject they it said, with some kind of flavoring or with just... Um... Yeah, white wine and a whole bunch of flavorings and stuff like that. And they just shove it in and they pump it until it like bloats. Oh, it's wow. It's really, really weird to watch. And they said, you go until it squirts out back at you. Oh. And they're just they're just pumping this this pork full of all sorts of juices, okay. so that might be the next thing that I want to try is it might be injecting. worth trying it and see what happens. Yeah, I imagine the ribs you probably can't inject them too much before they start to no because they're it's not like there's a ton of meat you know to it's not the same as like a brisket where you're you're pushing into three inches of meat you know you're talking about a you know an inch or at the most yeah. Um, Unless you get the extra meaty ribs. Have you ever yeah. tried those? No. And I haven't tried doing beef ribs either. That's another thing that I that I would like to try sometime because I do like beef. And beef ribs are bigger. You know, they look like dinosaur ribs almost in, in some cases. So I, I, I'm thinking about trying that, but I, I just, I'm so happy with the results of my normal ribs that uh, I'm, I'm not willing to try anything else. <laughs> so I will say the beef ribs when. I first started smoking stuff. I got, we bought a cow. Uh, well, he was dead. Obviously, but <laughs> he's in our freezer. But uh, it came with some beef ribs that I had never seen. Like like you said, it looked like dinosaur yeah. bones. I'm like, what in the world? So I'd never done beef ribs. So I thought I'd cook them like pork ribs, and they did okay. not cook like pork ribs. Um, and then I'm How like, okay, they, uh, they weren't that great. Oh, okay. Uh, because I didn't cook them for long enough. So um, they needed longer. And then I'm like, oh, maybe they need to be cooked like steak and just get them to like 140. And that didn't work out either. They need a long, slow cook, and it's usually a thicker piece of meat. It's yeah. almost like it's almost like cooking a small brisket. Okay. All right. But I'll tell you what. Um, my wife did some in the crock pot. Oh, so, that's a good idea. 
So, and that's, that's when I realized idea. how good they were. So she just threw them in the crock pot. She's like, let's see what they do. So yeah. they just cooked there for seven hours. Some of the best meat that I have had in a long time came out of a crock pot. And I'm just well, like, you shame me, woman. Yeah. What is going on? My wife does that. We have an Instapot. And um, yeah, the stuff that, like, you can literally take a, we should do an episode on the Instapot. You can take um, like a frozen pork roast and put it in the Instant Pot or frozen chicken. And in a half an hour, it's done. Like, it's amazing yeah. what comes out of it. Um, yeah. But well, I want to ask you a question about your ribs. When, how do you cut them? Um, erratically and like a caveman because okay. you, you think ribs would be straight. And there's not. There's like cross sections yep. and interconnecting sections. So basically, I just learned to go caveman style on it and save the best ones for company. Okay. So I, I found a couple tricks, you know, with the number of ribs that I've done. Like we, in the beginning, okay. I was chewing them up. Like the, the, you know, especially if you, if you get them to where they're really tender and they're coming off the bone pretty easily, like you don't want ribs that fall off the bone. You want them to stick to the bone a little bit, but mm -hmm. when you're manhandling them with a knife, it's easy to, to mess them up. So we, I tried a bunch of different knives. I went from. Uh, a, a really sharp, big, like butcher's knife to like paring knives to steak knives. I tried everything. And basically I was just, I was just ripping it up. What I found works the best is a really sharp bread knife. And that allows you to be able to, it's long and thin and you can cut perfect pieces. So um, that that's worked really good for me. So it's ironic you say that. Uh, in my research, it led me to a bread knife too, and it works a lot like a saw. So basically, you're just sawing those ribs, and it's perfect because the way the grain of the ribs is is it, it's going to go along the same line of where you're yep. going to cut with the bone. So you cut right through the bark, you go right through those extra sections of bone, yep. and it goes right down. My problem is the lower ribs, the smaller ones. Those are easy. You go lop 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 lop, and then you get yeah. great ribs. When you get up towards the top where you cut off that big chunk of meat, yeah, there that's where it gets wonky. It yeah, gets really the, backwards. Because you get the little turn. Yeah, you have to you have to you have to be careful of that. Yeah. And that's why people don't like the full spare rib. They would rather have the baby back ribs because they're you know, they're just that that rib piece and you can cut them a little bit easier. But personally I like the extra the extra piece at the top. I, I do too. Um if you're gonna smoke that long, you want some substance too. Yeah. And the top piece, the entire rib, is just better, you know? It's good. Yeah, it's so good. And the other thing that we found, too, that helps is to let them sit for a little while after you take them off the smoker. So we, we'll, I'll usually bring them inside and let them sit um, maybe about 10 minutes, 15 minutes before mm -hmm. we, we start cutting them up. And I think during that time, they 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 condition a little bit to where they're, they're uh, easier to cut rather than, you know, when you pull them off and they're hot and you're cutting through them. Yeah, so the resting period is what I was talking about before, too. So uh, ribs, I imagine, don't take as long as other things to rest, but do you find that they're juicier when you wait a little bit, or is it just easier to cut because they're not as hot? They might be a little bit juicier. It might pull some of the moisture back in because, you know, the the and that's the concept that that I'm accomplishing with the um, with the Wagyu tallow. The um, moisture is, it's not water, it's oil. So, mm -hmm. you know, when, when you say, oh, these juice, these are really juicy, you, it's not that you're, that you're filled with water. It's that, um, it's that feeling that comes from, from having oil inside, you know, the, the, uh, the oil that's connected to the, the meat, the rendered fat. So, um, when I add the tallow, that's adding that extra little bit of oil to it. So that they, they turn out super juicy, like they're just, they're really moist. Um, and I do think it, I waiting a little bit helps that because you're, you're not, um, you know, it, it allows it to, con to, to, to condense a little bit. Yeah. Also too, um, meat contracts, like the muscle actually goes like, like that and it contracts. Yeah. And then as, well, as it's heated up and cooked. So I've had some meats even that I'm like, oh man, this is unusually tough. Then I let it rest and it relaxes and I'm like, whoa, what happened to that tough meat? This is like butter, but it, it's all about the fat. And yeah. that's why if you're going to smoke, if anybody's listening and they're thinking about getting into smoking, 
It's all about the fat. If you have a lean cut of meat, don't try to smoke that. Yeah, all you're going to do is you're going to get smoky, tough meat. You want something with fat. So when you're smoking, you're doing it at low temperatures. And people ruin things when they grill. You ever see somebody take a really yeah. nice marbled piece of meat and it's just beautiful with all that fat? They slap it on the grill. They turn it way up. They sear both sides and they're like, I like it rare. Yeah. And it's like, there's like a lot of fat on this and they're cutting the fat out. I'm like, ah, oh, what are you doing? <laughs> I know. <laughs> you got to cook it low and slow because at about 145 degrees or so, and people argue on this, but about 145 degrees, that's when the fat starts to render. It turns into a liquid. And it becomes one with the meat. It makes it juicy, like you Super said. Super moist, yeah. And then if you're working with something like ribs or anything on the bone, like if you're doing um, a chuck roast or a T-bone steak, you have connective tissues, just mm -hmm. like we do. And the connective tissues start to break down at about the same temperature, but more accurately at about 170 to 195 degrees or 200 degrees. So that's why brisket takes so long. Because you have to get it not only up to 140, but once it hits 170, it can actually start down to break break down the connective tissue too. And you got to keep it there for a long time. Long time because yeah. fat does, and, and you got to do it. You have to time everything just right, and that's the whole thing with ribs. It's, it's all about timing. If you get it up to temperature to get the connective tissue done, but you've had it on too long at 145. All you did was lose all your fat out of the meat. It likely oh, just yeah. went away. Yeah. So it's all about timing. That's why your five and a half hour method appeals to me. The yeah, less it's... time you can have it on the smoker, but get the same temperature and effect, the better, so you don't lose the fat. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, I, I think if you if you can do it on the pork and the pit barrel, I think that'd be great. You know, the, <laughs> like I said, the the challenge I had is just the getting the temperature to be consistent. You know, I, I've seen people smoke some amazing stuff in file cabinets and old it's, washing I've machines. I've seen some of those videos. <laughs> you know, and and they're making like it's true high quality stuff. It's not about the equipment. It's about, I mean, it is about the equipment. If you have better equipment, it makes it a lot better. Like yeah. yours is extremely accurate, uh, and I'm pretty sure I can make a better, you know, a better roast in a pit barrel than I can in an old washing machine. But at the same time. You make do with what you have, and yeah. some of these guys are making way better stuff than I could ever make. Well, the the real professional, fire. yeah, the professional pitmasters, they use you know offset smokers, which is wood, and you know talk about they have to be able to manage their their fire and their smoke from that um, offset smoking box. And actually, when when I was looking at smokers, I think we talked about this in the in the pit barrel review episode. I was thinking about getting one of those because that's really the the pinnacle of smoking. If you, you know, you get one of these big, huge things that looks like it's a, a um, you know, like a, a, a 55 gallon drum turned on its side and it's, it weighs 2000 pounds and you tow it behind your car like that. That's an awesome smoker. But <laughs> the, there's no way to, at least from my perspective, I, I'm a novice. I couldn't get that to be a consistent temperature. And that's really what I wanted out of the smoker um, is to, to have the consistency. So for me, that the pellet smoker does that. Well, and you have to you have to be willing to do a lot of volume a lot of the time. So there's a couple of smoke places out near me, and I watch these guys every weekend, you know, 12, 13-hour yeah. days just smoking chicken and meat yeah. and all sorts of things. And this is really good, yeah, but it's like they're doing hundreds or more of these pieces of meat. It's like that that takes a lot of practice yeah, to get there. Yeah, they get good at it. They get good yeah, at so, it. To just go buy one and be like, hey, let's see what happens. <laughs> no, I'm not ready for that. <laughs> I'm I'm very I, happy with what I have. <laughs> I, I, I like um, having a little bit more primal. Well, yeah, I like you the... do. Yeah, but you're good at it, too. So you, you, you eh. know, you, I think you are. I think, I mean, from what I've seen, the results you, you get is pretty good. You've never tasted it. So That's true. I mean... <laughs> we got to get together and, and do a, t a, a taste off. <laughs> so. I, I do need to. I do need to challenge you to do something else besides ribs and chicken, though. <laughs> I would. I do want to try a brisket. Okay, don't go right to brisket. That's a big deal. What, what would you, you suggest? You, you have mastered the ribs. Uh, if you like pork, do a pork shoulder and then make pulled pork tacos with it. Oh, okay, that would be good. So that's what we did. I'll tonight. do some research I, on that. Yeah, just grab some. Just grab the pork butt. Pull it apart after you have to let a pork butt sit, 
you know, about 30 yeah. minutes. It okay. needs to sit and rest. But um, th- try that. Try a pork okay. butt or try a chuck roast. Oh, okay. I Oh, I'd love a chuck roast probably, yeah. Chuck roast ends up tasting like brisket to me if you do it right. Okay. It doesn't, it's not as labor intensive. Uh, it does take five or six hours, but it's, um, it's really good. So maybe we'll, maybe try, try something new and maybe we'll do an episode on it. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. I'm looking forward to it. But thank you for, but thank you for sharing your, uh, your, your method here. Oh, no problem. Thanks. Thanks for, for hanging out with me for a little while, Ian. Yeah, no. You got a, you got a a bad joke for me tonight? Uh, I don't. Yeah. (laughs) I got one for you. Okay, I want to hear it. All right, what did the baby corn say to the mama corn? I don't know. Where's my popcorn? Oh. (laughs) (laughs) See, that's pretty bad. (laughs) Are you my popcorn? Um, I I was actually leading into a joke. I said I don't have a dad joke because uh, I'm too sad because you heard the Pillsbury Doughboy died, right? No, I didn't. Yeah, yeast infection. Uh, is, <laughs> it was really sad. There's going to be a funeral at uh, 310 for 20 minutes. So <laughs> <laughs> He survived by uh, his brother John Doe and his wife Jane Doe. <laughs> You're just going off the wall. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, everybody, this has been Drinking with Tom. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. Have a great day, Dan. Later.